everybody. Welcome back to another episode of Two Legs. We are mainly a Paul McCartney solo podcast dealing with the solo career of Paul. I'm one of your two co-hosts, Andy Nichols, and joining me today is the one of the co-founders of Two Legs, Mr. Thomas Hunyadi. How are you, Tom? I'm doing great, Andy. Always great to see you, and uh, really looking forward to talking to our uh, to our guest today. That's right. And joining us today, uh, well, an interview long in the making, and uh, 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 for a couple of months we've been wanting to get him on, and then the book has finally been published. Uh, and congratulations, and welcome to Two Legs. Dr. Richard Driver. Oh, thank you, Andy and Tom. Um, yes, it's an absolute thrill to be here. I know we've all, the three of us have been talking for months, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, it's uh, yeah, a long time in the making and um, no pressure by that by that measurement. No, and, and um, <laughs> Richard is the proud author of a brand new book titled That Was Me, Paul McCartney's Career and Legacy yep. of the Beatles. And uh, it, uh, wow, it's a, uh, Truly a work of art. I, I have not finished it yet. I'm going to be honest. I'm about halfway through. I, I started it in Chicago and got halfway through. And when you and I got to meet each other there and you had your family, that was cool. You brought them to the fest. Um, was that your first ever fest? It was. And um, wow. it was also our first family vacation since COVID. And I, as I had a lot of fun. I think my wife had a blast entertaining an eight-year-old at the fest uh was pushing it at times um particularly right, right. sitting in some of the sitting in some of the sessions but yeah it was my first time and i'm i'm ready to go again so you know i don't think i'll be able to make new york but definitely looking ahead to to next year in chicago again yeah well cool. we'll, we'll we'll see you there because we're we'll we're tentatively planning to be there as well and uh yep. looking forward to seeing you there um Richard, give us a little bit of a background on um, your 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 education, your your fandom, um, your you know your your introduction to McCartney, all that good stuff. Sure. Well, uh, education wise, um, I have a PhD in American history. I earned in hmm. 2014. That now that dates me, I, <laughs> but um, so I have that degree, and so uh, I teach community college. With my degree and my McCartney fandom goes back to the anthology. Um, it goes mm -hmm. back to obviously it started with Beatles fandom more than uh, McCartney fandom, but right. um, from the anthology was introduced to all four of them, and then of course um, in the immediate aftermath, as my interest grew from the television broadcast to the new albums that were released um, to the the I guess it was a um, VHS tapes that they released um, a little bit later that had the full anthology or right, the unedited mm, version. Right. Mm -hmm. And then the first McCartney album was Flaming Pie, which came out only a couple years later. Mm, and right. that's what kickstarted my McCartney. So you, you, you jumped and, on right. McCartney with Flaming Pie. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. I remember watching all the VH1 specials. I'm sure there were yes. other, I'm sure MTV had a special, but I specifically remember the VH1 I think it was a town hall with uh, yep. town John, hall. John, Fugel John sang. Fugel, Fugel sang. Yep. Yeah. Fugel yep. Sang. Fugel um, yeah. And so from there, it just, um, yeah, went into overdrive <laughs> and every new album release um, was try my best to get it. If not day of, then as early as I could day of. Right. Were yeah. you, so did you have any McCartney collect in your collection prior to that point in time of the anthology Flaming Pie or not uh, really? I did not directly. Now, my dad did. Now, my dad grew up in the 70s, so he had um, some Wings albums. He had Be uh, Beatles albums, mm. um, but he did not have, I don't think he had much after Wings Over America. I think um, that would have been in when he was a teenager, and so it, it, it may have peaked for him there, and he went into other groups mm. and bands in the, right. in the late 70s. So um, I, I now have all of those, but that would have been the closest I was prior to the anthology. Cool. Hmm. Yeah. And there, well, yeah, and it's, it's funny, too, that, because the Wings Over America one, or I think it's Wings Over America and Band on the Run are the Columbia reissues. Oh, the so Columbia. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It's, and so right. um, it really, it, it really places when my dad was listening to those, um, which I always love thinking of. So it was in the eight. Yeah. They were later pressings. Yeah. 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 Right. 
talk. Um, let's, let's, uh... I was going to say, so Richard, um, oh, go ahead. <laughs> when when did you get the idea to start writing this book and uh, talk about some of the you know the hurdles that you went through, pitching it, publishing, all that good stuff? Um, well, I'll I'll let me do that in reverse order. So yeah, <laughs> hurdles were. I pitched it and a signed contract with Lexington a month prior to the COVID lockdown starting. So the biggest wow. hurdle was all of the challenges that um, we all faced uh, over the next, what, two to three years. And so um, I know a lot of folks, I know y'all talked to folks, I've listened to other folks talk about that they had, that it was a real opportunity for them to work on projects, to write. Right. And um, I'm envious of that because um, uh, especially teaching at a community college, we had to really reorient um, to go online, to meet students and to troubleshoot their needs, things like that. So um, that was one of the big hurdles was finding time. Um, but over, to, over the course of lockdown and everything, it, it worked out. Um, I was, I guess, lucky in that um, my, my editor, who had pitched the idea to me, I, I'll give her credit. Her name is Courtney Morales at Lexington, was super flexible, understood that everyone's going through what lockdown entailed. Um, and so um, she was more than willing to put up with many, many delays. Um, mm. But as far as the background to it, I've, I've always worked on the Beatles um, in some respect in my academic work and my research. Um, my master's thesis was about the Beatles as a commodity item. Um, and then in my dissertation uh, chapter, the Beatles chapter in the book is um, a revised, heavily revised version of a similar chapter that was in my dissertation, really focusing on economic oh, opportunities wow. and work. Um, and so it was always in my, I guess, wheelhouse. And I, I always found McCartney to be a really useful example of just a working musician from that perspective. Right. And so I'd been giving conference papers and um, Courtney Morales, who I mentioned, um, contacted me prior to, I think it was the Popular Culture Association in 2019 and asked if, uh, I believe I was presenting on Egypt Station that year oh. and was uh, asked if I would like to meet, mm -hmm. to talk about the potential for a book link, book link project. Um, and so it, it started there. Um, it took me about another almost year <laughs> to work up a proposal. I moved in the middle of that. And so, um, yeah, I built from there. And then, of course, McCartney 3 came out within all of that and really added to some of the <laughs> scope and the, um, the research right. that, that I was doing. And then got back to her. So it, there were a lot of real benefits that occurred while I was working on it um, and being able to sort of sort of explore legacy and McCartney's career. Um, and then yeah. finally finished last December. <laughs> yeah. And the book, the book was published in August, right? Uh, yes. Or July. I'm, I'm not entirely clear on when it hit, when the street date was, but um, contract said August for sure. <laughs> wow. That's funny. You know, we're we're in a world now where there it seems like, you know, we're getting a couple McCartney books a year. You know, we got the McCartney Legacy, we got the the photo book, the after the getting nothing book, yeah. You know, Blaney's books. You know, we're getting yeah. uh, getting a lot of books lately. What what stands? Why is your stay? Why should people read your book? What stands out about your book? What are you trying to say in your book? Well, I think um, from a large perspective, it's it's not another biography so to speak i didn't aim to write a biography um i really were wanted to talk about um, mccartney's career and its long-term uh, pop culture pop music impact and influence stemming from the beatles through a a half century now solo career and so um there's a lot more emphasis i feel in um his solo career which of course as you mentioned the mccartney legacy is now is really leading the way on mm. on that effort. So I I think it probably pales in comparison, particularly on the amount of detail and narrative following his his life more specifically. But I think what I like to be able to tell folks is that it for me it, it allowed a connection to listening to McCartney, seeing the direction his career has gone over 
different periods, through different events, um, through hardship, through celebration. And I think there's a lot of fan connection that that I enjoyed revisiting. And then that is something that I really like to share with folks that, you know, if you've seen McCartney live or if you remember when an album came out, it, it allows a connection in that respect. So I think it, it maybe I like to say that it's a little broader in that sense. Um, if maybe doesn't go into too many narrative details as there might be in other books. Mm, yeah. What the, the research aspect of it? I mean, uh, talk about um, you know getting into the research and um, you know obviously you're I mean you're young right you're a younger person and you have to go back and you have to look at all these articles. Um, you start obviously internet now. I mean, you're I mean you're definitely benefited benefited from that as opposed to some of our past guests, you know, like Chris Welch, you know, or Chris Salovic, uh, you know, who wrote uh, bios on, on McCartney. So talk about the your the research end of of writing the book or doing the book. Yeah, and you're absolutely right. the The internet was a huge tool and a massive resource, um, not simply in. Um, Some of the available repositories that a lot of folks have done work transcribing interviews, curating Mm. materials. Um, I know, for instance, um, the Beatles Bible and the Palma Project. That's that's one that I found um, would be a great resource to to, you know, find interviews. And then I would actually, in some cases, go out and acquire said interviews. So I might then uh, go find, say, an issue of Rolling Stone or... um, um, an issue of Club Sandwich and these type of things. So to really find those materials, but that was a great resource and a great starting point. I was telling um, a librarian recently that one of the um, the biggest maybe surprises, but also very interesting finds for me was that McCartney and then um, and Linda as well. They were both inter- or he was interviewed twice. She was interviewed once for Playgirl magazine, which yep, I I have one with it. Yep. I'm in the process of getting one now just because it just seems like such a, a unique um, a unique find. But that it was the those websites really gave me an introduction to finding those type of materials. Mm-hmm. And I, I, I counterbalanced it with uh, the bibliography that we have at our disposal, the number of works. Um, some of it is um, like many years from now, um, Fab, yeah. Yeah. High Howard Sounds. Um, what's the, um, I I did use Norman's book to a degree, Mm -hmm. um, but I usually tried to balance it with other books and other uh, materials. Um, Mm -hmm. Spitz's biography of of the Beatles from 05 was a big uh, help in the Beatles chapter. Uh, Unfortunately, timing-wise, the the McCartney legacy was released only a couple days after I finished my um, my draft. So I was able to Mm -hmm. work in some um, last-minute... Citation references citations. and clarif- clarifications right. um, earlier this year, but it just wasn't out in time um, to meet what were already delayed deadlines. Um, <laughs> last last item I'll I'll mention that I found to be a big resource, and this is one that um, I think gives us an opportunity to think about um, some of the memory associated with it. Are the archive editions themselves to mm-hmm. be able to go right. through yeah. some of the interviews, some of the essays provided, the photos that document those periods really well, but then also allow um, either McCartney or others involved to to look back and to talk about it. Mm-hmm. No, yeah. the, the Wings Over America one, I believe was by, I believe it was by David Frick. There were a number mm-hmm. by David Frick that I found mm-hmm. um, really insightful to. Wildlife, I know he wrote the wildlife yeah. Uh, essay. Yeah. Yeah. So those, those were really, um, and I found that they, they really allowed the intro into the era, into the time period. Um, in ways that I didn't expect to find. Richard, are you familiar with the rocks backs pages? And do you have, have you had for, for research and pulling, like that's a great site that um, kiddo tool told us about it. Um, you actually, if you subscribe to that, you can get access to all of the, um, you know, the trade magazine reviews and stuff and the articles that were published um, worldwide. It's a really good resource. I'm not sure if you're familiar with I- it. I've, it sounds familiar. I've never accessed it. I'll have to look that up. Yeah, um, Kit, on... Kit, credit to Kid O'Toole with that. That's a great reason. And I actually had <laughs> used it a lot in England, when I was in England research writing my dissertation. So, um, yeah, check that one out. I mean, it's a great – I mean, I know you can find things through your means, but um, it's, a, it's, it's, it's been around for a good 15, 20 years. 
Okay. Well, thank you. Yeah. No, I'll, I'll definitely, you said rocks back pages. Yes, that's correct. Yeah. yeah. Excellent. Um, well, I'm always happy to have those, those new, those new, because you know, one thing I've found too, is that when you find these things, it's, it's hard to not just take a deep dive immediately. Oh, right. Yeah. Especially with interviews, especially with interviews, you know, you can oh, have, yeah. you could, like you said, you're, you're, you're tracking down ones just to have them. Yeah, you know? definitely. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, one thing I wanted to ask you about is, and I get it, as I mentioned at the top, I did not finish it, but I did read just about a half of it and um, really impressed with um, your opening chapter, um, which was basically on the Beatles period, but you spent a considerable amount of time talking about the Ed Sullivan show. And not just the fact that it was, obviously it was a big cultural phenomenon that it was, but it was very interesting that you, to see you talk about um, the medium of television as the power that that got out there you know we weren't just talking about the beatles going on sullivan you you spent a lot of time um explaining the technology what was available and why television was so powerful in 1964 can you expound on that a little bit and that moment in time where we were as a society you know obviously it was there was only three states there was, now we're oversaturated <laughs> right we can there's but back then you had like five things to tune into so that plays into it too but please uh, enlighten us that Oh, well, <laughs> I'll do my best. I think, you know, um, as you mentioned, uh, sort of the power that it provides, and I think this is, you know, it's an often cited number that 73 million Americans watched that broadcast. And I think it's one of those one of those numbers that um, we don't necessarily question. I mean, not that we need to question it, the, the, the facts, the, the numbers are there, but to really envision what that meant for the time and the, the capability of a medium, a piece of technology to give that many viewers an access point and then share it across the country. And then later we have examples such as the One, One World broadcast that achieve a similar means around the globe. And then I think on a, in a broader context, one way that um, TV is just so powerful is that it, it brings events to Americans far more quickly than, you know, maybe we're capable even mm -hmm. 10 years earlier you know and i'm thinking if you look ahead two three five years to the vietnam war the sheer amount of coverage that americans are um, introduced to that americans have um, access to builds upon that same power i mean i think it, it's 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 a connective tissue where everyone sees this event it's not simply a matter that they might talk about it the next day it's that they live through it. It provides that cultural moment that might not have otherwise, you know, there's no real similar means prior to that. Radio may uh, achieve that in some respects, but just because, as you said, there's also only three networks. There's only three three places where you can go, and everyone's looking at, in that case, one broadcast, and it achieves, you know, that level of viewership. And so I think the technology... Right. Um, and it, the technology was rapidly changing, and it's going to continue to rapidly change after that. That year, it's in black and white. Within only a couple of years, it's in color, which then again changes the dynamic. It changes what you view and how you see it. Do you think mm -hmm. that the Beatles would have achieved the similar success had, in 1964, had the technology that we have now, where everything is, you know, that's a really interesting question. I hope so. <laughs> I hope so. I hope that um, that regardless of the technology, regardless of the moment in time, that they would have become the phenomenon that they that they were, that they continue to be. I think the technology we we have now, be it from not only three TV networks to cable, streaming, social media, um, satellite radio, all of this does perhaps limit the scope or limit the attention that audiences may be able to achieve in that you may be able to broadcast a a similar career defining or significant historical moment but again the audience may simply be smaller because there are so many more right. options so many more options right gotcha um, but i hope so i absolutely hope so maybe it would just be everything would be streamed on across multi-platforms it would be universal maybe that's, maybe that's <laughs> the, the goal we should we should strive for yeah 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 S sticking to that to that area because you you do talk about it 
quite a bit. And, you know, we're so, you know, Paul wants us to believe, you know, his story about we're not going to America without a number one, you know, which in the long run, it's, it's simply just not the truth. I mean, it's a nice story, right? And he likes to tell nice stories. Um, but, but one, I got to commend you for, hey, you, you didn't put that in the book. But you, you told the truth. I mean, they were, Ed Sullivan is, was always looking for new talent, right? They were already previously, they were, they were booked. It just so happens that coincidence that, you know, I want to hold your hand is, is number one before they get there. And, and jump, not to jump ahead, but a little bit, but, you know, when I was reading your chapter on anthology, mm-hmm. you know, I went back and I watched the first couple episodes. And Paul, that's, Paul does tell that story. A couple minutes later, then you hear George Harrison say, well, we were already booked to, to, to go, you know, so <laughs> so right there, <laughs> you know, you know, two different memories. Now, now, maybe Paul had said that, you know, maybe he did. But in the, in the way, though, they were still already booked to go. So it was still consequential uh, or I'm sorry, coincidence that, you know, it became number one before they actually got there, because I mean, they, I think they were in Paris when it became when it went to number one. Right. Yes. Uh, and the next stop was 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 U.S. So so I definitely you know like the fact that you you know you're going for <laughs> and the, that story's nice, but it's not necessarily the truth. You know. Well, and leave it to George to cut almost straight to the to the fact that they exactly. were going anyways. Exactly. They've been booked for yeah. months. Um, right. And I think as well as you just mentioned, you know, they're in Paris, and that itself I think was was also a test. Because the audience in France was far different than the audiences they'd experienced yeah. in, in guys, England. Yeah. 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 So I think, you know, they're they're expanding and they're they're kind of they're putting their feet out there. Whether or not they were gonna go with the number one, they were already going and it was also they they'd been sort of testing the waters to see what types of success they would have outside mm-hmm. of their home market. Yeah. Cause so let's Richard, say they go let's say they go in, in 63, all right? They've only had a little, air, little, very little airplay come 63, right? I mean, a couple, what, VJ and, and who else are... You mean in America? In, yeah, in America. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, if, yeah. I mean, if they go in 63, I mean, that's probably... Well, let's you know, not forget probably... that our fellow our fellow people north of us understood a lot quicker yeah. and got it before we did that's in, true, in yeah. Canada. Yeah, that's, that's true. You right? know, they caught on like fire in Canada a lot quicker than they did down here. So... Mm-hmm. Very true. Um, Richard, so if I understood this right, so the first chapter of your book was pulled from another piece of, from your dissertation. Is that, is that right? Yeah. So you yeah. made that the first chapter of this book. Right. Yeah. With, with some pretty, um, heavy, uh, revisions to sort of take out some of the more, uh, particularly historiographical elements sure. that were, that were present. Not that those aren't, um, valuable discussion points, but to tighten it up a little bit to, you know, correct some grammar some you know a few years old aspects of it and then to really i really wanted to link it better with um the emphasis on on mccartney on mccartney right yeah Mm -hmm. Yeah. because i was like i was thinking of oh i'm gonna this is gonna be a book just about paul and i'm like wow here's a whole chapter on ed sullivan wow okay but well and 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 the and the um, more popular than Jesus and the and revolver. Yes, well, yeah. the '66 and, tour. Yeah, the, I mean, the big kind of the big the too. big the big kind of cultural moments that defined the Beatles in this country. At Sullivan, more popular than Jesus. And Jesus. How it, how it affected American audiences, especially in the South. Yeah, especially, especially in the South. And I love that on that little quote of George. You know, he didn't care that they burned them because they bought them already. Burned them all over. <laughs> Yeah. And then Ringo said, "Well, then they had to buy them all over again." <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. One of the one of the things I, I really love about um, that chapter and getting to revisit it was that, um, particularly in talking about the record burnings in '66, um, one of the most prominent record burnings took place in the town where I grew up. Um, years before I was born there, years before my parents moved there, but that was Longview, Texas, and um, the this is a, a I think a pretty common story now too, but the next day lightning struck the the radio antenna for the station oh, yeah, that had hosted that's it. Right, yeah, yeah, that's um, what you wrote. yeah. And I think a DJ or the station manager got injured, so um, a real interesting sort of response from whomever or whatever to um, burning the Beatles records. Yeah, <laughs> interesting. I want to ask you a question, Richard. Do you think, in terms of uh, 
uh, kind of the, the the political aspect of these things in this country and how Americans responded to some of these things, especially the Jesus remark, but other things too, the Beatles drug taking. Do you think that that, because obviously I think in the rest of the world, especially in Europe, uh, people were not as um, cheesed off by it or, t- um, you know, taken aback by any of the comments. They People in Europe, for the most part, are a little bit more understanding and they're a little more, they, they was here, Americans in this country, especially in the 60s, and probably, and you could even say today, they're very sensitive to this stuff. What, what, so is that just, is that just Americans as a whole, especially in the South, like the, the, and how they re- react to things? Because they're, it's, I mean, I mean, we're all different, right? But there, but the responses to some of these things, especially as this, as the '60s wear on, and with the Jesus statement, especially the the LSD dr- drug era, you know, I'm sure there was plenty of people in the South who said, huh, "Later for these guys, they've gone crazy." So what do you think that's about? I think it's it's a reflection of the United States post World War II on a very on a very large scale that Americans were beginning to experience what these what these may what those type of developments may have represented, whether they were just changes on on maybe a broader scale or they challenged some of the sort of political structures or the economic structures that had taken effect. I think particularly when we think about the um, conformity that was so um, prominent in the 1950s, and you see rock and roll, you see popular music, you see films challenge that sort of, uh, that structure. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, you move into the 1960s and you it, it, it just continues to grow and grow. And so then when you bring in, you know, questioning of, um, say the role or the place of religion, even if it's misinterpreted, even if the statement is taken out of context, it then becomes something that perhaps um, affects the status quo or affects how um, Americans, maybe parents, maybe older generations, expected younger audiences or their children to to behave or to conform. Right, because they're entering the 1960s with those clearly defined 1950s values post-war, right? Yeah. And now here comes this whole shake up and you've been conditioned to look and live your life a certain way and they're like (laughs) yeah and i I mean it's the beatles are uh, an excellent example of this because we do see so many areas where something they say or an activity that they um they do their behavior whatever it is right their look itself fashion becomes something that uh, people react to right and they either react and it it inspires them or they react and there's a backlash to it. I think the same is true, particularly when we, we do remember and we think about how the history of rock and roll unfolded. I mean, there's so many myths and, and sort of stories surrounding Elvis as well that also, you know, thinking about the Beatles are not going to come without a number one also proved to be, to be incorrect, right? That for instance, when Ed, when he was on Ed Sullivan, supposedly during the third show, he was only shown from the waist up out right. of the fear that he was going to gyrate. But when you go back and look at the broadcast, you look at what he was performing that night, it was gospel songs. It was it was not, you know, rock and roll. It was not this music that supposedly was going to inspire revised you know, sexual attitudes or mores. Right. And you, really, rock and roll, by the time the Beatles arrived in this country, I mean, you've got three years into the 60s, Rock and roll of the 50s was kind of in, in the back mirror by that point, you know? You were into the clean, manufactured pop Oh, yeah, you had pop the teenage, stars. teenage, yeah, you teenage know, Fabian pop stars. and all this, Elvis yeah. and Little Richard and, and Jerry Lee Lewis, that was years past, so that was gone. So rock and roll had gotten very, um, like, stale, you know, and very commercialized. Safe, yeah. And safe. Oh, safe, yeah. Right, so right. it's... So, and, yeah. I yeah, think, no, and that, as you mentioned, right, that's where, you know, the the more popular than Jesus. So that's where the drug taking, right, the, um, um, and discussing LSD. And then, of course, later, or, harder. Or posing harder. naked on an album cover. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, yeah, yeah that's, that was actually the example <laughs> I was thinking of next. And I was, I was thinking about harder drugs alongside that. But these type of things, um, you know, are supposed to then fit into that, maybe that safe structure. And they're not. They're not fitting that at all. They're, you know, they're, they're, they're challenging that. And I think 
back to your original question <laughs> is <laughs> I don't know that uh, Americans, you know, America, uh, young Americans may have been interested in that. Some young Americans yeah. clearly weren't right. Those that are burning records didn't want it either, or they had been convinced that they didn't want it. But I think, you know, generally that Americans were confronting this and within American society, they were conflicted. Um, whether it's mm -hmm. excited, whether it's teeny boppers, whether it's something more akin to art, which of course we have the, the benefit of hindsight to, to link with. Do link you with. find, yeah, good point. Do you find that today when you are in the South, right? Is, is, is that latitude, has it been relaxed in the 50 years since, or is there still a, a conservative movement of, of stronghold of that ideology still? Oh, yes. Yeah, there's definitely a strong conservative ideology. And um, without referencing Texas politics or even Texas news right here in 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 these months, um, it's definitely very strong, very prominent. Um, I don't think it's necessarily uh, as closed off, perhaps, as we might envision it to have been in the 60s, right, that there's not. But there is definitely a divide, maybe ideologically. Um, but yeah, definitely still very present. Interesting. Hmm. <laughs> well, let's uh, let's jump into some solo Paul here, and uh, and we'll just jump right off onto the the first album with the with the first track, "Lovely Linda," the lovely Linda. And I mean, you know, as a younger fan, I mean, we we got the we you know as younger fans, all of us, I mean, we go back and we listen to these albums, and not you know not unfortunately not in the real time, and then we go back and we hear you know, a song like the lovely Linda and in the fact that it's just this little nippet, it's kind of like, you know, uh, her majesty, it's just this little piece of unfinished, uh, we, you know, what's this about? We don't know what he's trying to do, but then, you know, you obviously you talk about it in the book, you know, these are, you know, he's, he's, you know, this is his new, you know, you got a pit here, um, from a quote from, you know, just as the Beatles were beginning to fragment, Lena Eastman came into my life as not only my wife, but 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 also my muse. You know, people are not really getting the, getting this um, at early on either. So they're listening to this and they hear this lovely Linda track and you're like, oh, I don't know what the, I mean, I would love to hear from older older fans and, and your opinions on, you know, hearing this, just this little piece. And, you know, you being introduced to his new muse, which, you know, before, you know, he had this working, like, great working relationship with, with John, and then now here's, you know, someone that's going to totally influence his life for the next, uh, what, 38 years? Um, 29. 28 years, 29. So 29. 29. 29, yeah, thank you, 29 years. And um, and all these great songs that came from, from, from Linda, so it's pretty pretty cool yeah i think and as well as like you like you mentioned being not a first generation fan not you know witnessing the breakup not having the album in that type of context i think it's beneficial for for that album because you can you can listen to it and you can hear what like what you mentioned with with the quote that i cited where his real emphasis and what he's putting into it are moving away from the beatles it then, of course, gets, you know, gets a lot of baggage attached to it. The album, the McCartney album altogether. But I also, and um, I, I really linked, you mentioned Her Majesty. I linked Her Majesty and the lovely Linda um, together. And one of the reasons that I, you know, I'm listening to this and thinking about what these two songs represent. They're both short, for one. Um, both, I think, by design were short. But at the same time, Her Majesty is the end of Abbey Road at the end of all the production, all the work that went into Abbey Road. It's an accident, if you will, because it's at the end of the tape and they just simply left it on. It becomes this beautiful um, sort of follow up to the end. But then six months later, his new album is his first material, notwithstanding the let it be album, which is soon to be on its coattails or soon to mm. overshadow it perhaps it's in that same vein, right? It's in that same very direct, that very um, straightforward, almost confessional type of song. Mm -hmm. And, you know, of course, then he says that it's, it's meant to be something of a trailer for a song that was, he was going to complete later, which 52 right. years or 53 years later, I guess we're all still waiting for what the lovely Linda would have become. Yeah. Um, probably, <laughs> probably a 10 minute epic, no doubt. Um, 
Right. But I, I think it, it for uh, you know, second generation, third generation fans, those that are listening to it, um, out of the 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 context of 1970, it maybe allows for a greater reflection of just what Linda provided in his life, in his career, the family, mm. the the life that the lives that they built together. Um, obviously, in the wake of the tragedy of the Beatles ending. And I, hmm. lovely Linda is just such a, I think it's a very sweet and very cathartic almost recognition of what's to follow, what's to, what right. type of connection is available or would be available. Yeah. And this is also like the, his beginning of his departure from, from the Beatles, like you talk about, it's, it's the, the, the test, right? It's the test of, of the audio equipment, right? It's, it's just him, you know, experimenting on, on, his, on his own being on his own and him also, you know, first thing he's singing about is, is the woman who helped him get out of his funk. Yeah. And so, yeah, it takes on a very uh, technical aspect in that regard, right? Because it is a test, but then it's also um, opening that door. Richard, I noticed and also in the book, um, in early in this in this period too, right around the solo, you know, McCartney and Ram and the negative reaction to uh you know, these albums was a was basically the the main idea of my dissertation that I wrote. And you basically talked about how, you know, they blamed him for the breakup, but we're here we are praising Imagine and all things must pass and these are great and and McCartney and Ram, yeah, so it's just I you I saw that in chapter two and I'm like, ah, He's right. He's, he's 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 speaking my language. And you do you feel that that definitely was a bias from the journalist at the time? At that one hundred percent. We've asked Chris. We've asked Chris Welch this, and we've asked um, yeah. you know, a few authors this too. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. I think. Um, and I would not take the credit for for making that claim by any by any measurement. But and I was just um, I was revisiting um, um, Aaron uh, Torkelson Weber's book where she talks about the historiography and the, the the narrative that has existed and shifted over time and um yeah i think there was there was definitely bias we know there's bias from rolling stone we know that the um the mccartney review was heavily revised the original version was rejected out of a, a position by um jan winner that it was this is a statement as opposed to an album and then, of course, it, it carries forward. And I, I, I think I referenced the Ram review in Rolling Stone on on a couple of occasions. Yes, just Mr. Because, Landau. Yeah, just because it's so um, harsh. It's just so dismissive. And not that there aren't other equally dismissive remarks made about Ram in 1971, but it really stands out for the perhaps the positioning that Rolling Stone was taking at Isn't that moment. That and the argument I made in, in my work was that when you're reading these reviews that are so negative, that's telling you more about the author than it is about the actual music. Yeah. That's, that's yeah. their feelings. coming. That's what, that's, and that's something that I felt and learned. And I, you know, when you're reading these vile, vile, really negative, negative, you know, it's music. It's like Paul says, he goes, it's, this is not rocket science or like your life doesn't depend on it. And you're reading these so critically mean-spirited reviews that says more about the author and journalist than it does the actual music right yeah, yeah. and at the same time it does we, we know it affected paul and yes. yeah it, and, and th these albums were successful though right both going to number one one going uh McCartney commercially one yeah because the, pe yeah, the people know what's good and then on top of that, he has to do that at the beginning of the 80s as well, because then he's now he's hearing, oh, John Lennon was the Beatles. You know, the Beatles were John Lennon after. Now, that's not John's fault that that's not that, that he was murdered and that, that people were, you know, saying that. But then he's got then he's got to hear this all over again. Yeah, but not know? only that, yeah. but then let's yeah. just, I mean, let's just not without getting too deep. I mean, the psychological effect of that, I mean, that's. Yes, right. the Beatles after 1970. That was a that was a psychological blow, but then you know his best friend is gunned down. I mean that's why I defend Paul's 80s work because this was a man dealing with a lot of pain. Okay, so some of the music's not the best, fine, but it, this is his way of dealing with it. 
Well, and it, it, it fits into his career work, right? It fits into his style. It fits into his method of writing. And it fits, if it's disliked in 1971, if it's disliked in 1984 or 86, it still is going to fit what we know to be his approach, right? His his writing style, his recording patterns. It's just Tom, a good, it's a good point, Tom. Um, but it, it's so easy to just pile on Paul. It's just, it's like, it's the thing mm-hmm. to do. It just then in 1971, or hell, or even now, you know, there's memes of him as an old granny and stuff like that. Now, you know, it's just so easy to do, and it's really crappy because he's just a good guy who just wants to do what he wants to do, you know. And uh, the fact that people like to take the, you know, take the piss out of him is uh, kind of crappy. Agreed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's. <laughs> Let, let's let's talk a little band on the run because this is finally I mean although he's had plenty of success right he's had multiple number ones at this point uh, he's had multiple number one albums at this point so um, although he's still kind of getting some some backlash with the critics he's still he's finding a lot of commercial uh, success but but band on the run just takes it you know to a whole whole nother level um, you, you write about the success of, of the album. One thing I didn't realize, and I want you also to talk about this too, was while doing your research and, and finding stuff out. Like, I didn't realize that Band on the Run didn't go to number one until six months six months after it's released in the UK. I mean, I found that really astonishing. You yeah, know? no, it was it was um, definitely, um, I guess, a slow burner by that, by, right. by that time delay, if you will, or that, that level uh, or that length of, of time before it went to number one. But I think it's, 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 it's unique in that respect too, because it almost like, you know, you think about the preceding records, whether it's Red Rose Speedway, which did go to uh, number one mm-hmm. uh, short. Mm-hmm. I think it had a short stay at number one because of the red and blue albums in the States. Right. And then um, living in the material. And, George, and then George's well, album bumped yeah. it out. Yeah. 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 Um, and I think it, it's unique in that you, the track record almost seems to be for, for Paul. And this may have been, True, just because of the first, you know, the first few albums, first couple of Wing albums, to move away from that record really almost quickly, right? Because we know mm-hmm. in the summer of '73, there's the um, the European tour, and then they're going to go to to Lagos, and then in '74 we've got a couple of projects that are coming that are coming along in the pipeline, right. but they right. he, he he stuck with it. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it goes to number one three different times in the U.S. You know, which is a, which is a you know crazy feat to think of. Um, first single, uh, "Hell on Wheels," which you know was on the album here in the states, not on the U.K. Uh, the but better, the better one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> U.S. number ten, U.K. number twelve. Uh, then Jets released. Uh, that's uh, number seven in both sides of the Atlantic. And then you got "Band on the Run," which is number one here and uh, number three in, uh, in the UK. So he, he did benefit, even though he didn't want those singles or, you know, album cuts as singles, it did, the album did benefit and pretty much allowed him to not have to release really anything, you know, well, in yeah. 74, and, you know, because it, it was just the machine. I mean, it just sold after, it sold and sold. And right, yeah, right there, what you just mentioned, right? That's one of the, immediately one of the unique aspects of it is that there's, um, more than one single, more than one album cut pulled from it, and they continue to promote it. And mm-hmm. um, the name of the Capitol executive that I know I talked about, his name is just Al escaped. Curry. There you go, Al Curry. Pushed, you know, and pushed Paul to 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 continue that. Um, and plus, then he's rebuilding Wings, and so you have a, an album that continues to hit number one. You're rebuilding Wings, right. and you can really in you can. Um, create that new version of of the band to back it up, and then of course start new recordings leading up to massive right. Wings of the World tour. Mm. Mm. Yeah, and then um, also uh, not here in the UK or, or not not here in the US or the UK, but then uh, Mrs. Vanderbilt's released as a single all throughout Europe and in Australia, and it does well in the in those countries too so this was just a you know a powerhouse of, of an album and we kind of you know andy and i we kind of we kid around you know about being fatigued from the album or whatever but we both under we, we both appreciate and understand 
its importance in McCartney, especially in the 70s. I mean, this was finally the album that put him, you know, that, you know, shut the critics up finally. I mean, it's, uh, you know, as Lennon said, you know, he'll make a good album when he's when he gets when he's scared into it. Now, I don't know if that's the case, <laughs> <laughs> you know, for 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 Band on the Run. But uh, I mean, he definitely, you know, the, the two band members leaving, uh, you know, well, and, uh, and there's you know, the I mean, listen, the other records are great. We love them all. McCartney, Ram, no, Wildlife, yeah. Frigo, Speedway. But there's a confidence with Band on the Run. Yeah. And um, maybe that's, you know, people, you know, people wanted to hear that in 1970 and they just were not going to hear that in 1970 or 71 it was too you know he was too close to the beatles thing he wasn't going to come out and be confident after his world was shattered it took him a couple of years to build back up to that whereas john and george were a little more confident like they didn't need the confines of the group as much as paul did so that's why they're you know everything you know their their early albums are great and in their own right but um Paul's, you know, just didn't, you know, unfairly, you know, I think they're just as good, you know, but the, that was not how it was perceived at the time. And band on the run, boom, there you go. One of the things I found, I'll say difficult, really, in writing about band on the run was first, that it felt like it's been written about. It felt like it's that album that everyone, you know, you yeah. ask a Paul McCartney fan, you ask a, a Beatle fan, what's right. your favorite? host Beatles Paul McCartney album and it's always Band on the Run as reference and I'm I'm certainly someone who has done that although I, I feel like it's uh shifted pretty dramatically in recent years but to really to come at it and discuss it without that type of of baggage if you will to sort of talk about its merits to talk about you know we we know the 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 very famous story of its recording in Lagos we know Oh. The all the events that transpired there. We know that we have uh, the two Wings band members leaving on the eve, and so it it to get away. It, it was it was really a challenge, but an enjoyable challenge to sort of get away from that that narrative and to really think about it in some of the the details that y'all just mentioned. Right, the confidence, right, right. the the sound of it, and it, it's it's self produced by Paul just as right. much as Red Rose Speedway was, but. One of the things that I've always enjoyed about it was there's a definite textural difference that I've found. And so that was one of the things that I really I, I wanted to highlight. Um, I I thought it was a su success. I'm open to criticism on that approach. But... <laughs> would you would you would you agree that when Paul has been faced with uh, a lot of, you know, difficulties or strife, especially with, you know, Band on the Run and Tug of War? I mean, emotionally wise, I mean, think about that, like two albums that have a lot of, you know, um, baggage, emotional baggage or what have you that went into those uh, making of those albums. You know, there's a reason why people go to those two because of, um, you know, out of, you know, what he went through. And then obviously you're getting two fantastic records um, that will really, when the day comes, when you look at, you know, when all these articles and uh, all these uh, publications start publishing these tributes after he's long gone, they're going to end all the ones that hated him, they're going to give you like the list. Here's the five up McCartney albums you should listen to. You know, Band on the Run's going to be up there, and you know, Tug of War is going to be on that list. You know it. And probably Flaming Pie, I would imagine, for some of those same yes. reasons. Exactly. Yeah. Right. Yeah. No. yeah. And I think, yeah, I mean, Andy, what you're, what you're, I think what you said is, 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 is just accurate because it's, these are the moments where he seems to truly thrive, right? Where, Whatever the criticism was, whatever, you know, people might say was lacking, why is it suddenly not there? It's not that some of the, you know, the writing style hasn't changed. It's just something about right. those moments, right, whether it's the Wings members quitting and they're going off to Lagos or, you know, tug of war. It's John Lennon's murder and the entire Beatles family dealing with that because tug of war has got Ringo on it. It's got uh, George Martin George producing Martin. it. Yeah. Um, it's got yeah. um, it, it it brings those those connections back in and then Flaming Pie which is released prior to Linda's death but her was, yeah, her, her she, diagnosis was in the was middle of six, it right yeah right and George yeah, Martin we'll is to, involved we'll, George Martin's yeah. involved with that record so it, it checks yeah. those emotional boxes yeah. in another way right. go ahead Tom right no I'm saying we'll get we'll get to Flaming Pie in, in, <laughs> in, a, in a few minutes but uh, you know I I, I was definitely I'm always interested in people's takes of Paul during the 80s because some people want to say he was lost. 
uh, you know, he lost his way or, or the, the writing wasn't good. And, you know, he's working with all these, all these other people, you know, successful uh, singers like Stevie Wonder, Michael Jackson. And, and what, what's your feeling on, on Paul in, in the eighties? Do you think he, he was, you know, losing his way or at all, or, or just talk about the, some of the writing in his albums from the eighties. Richard's saying no. And I like, no, that. I, I, yeah. I <laughs> no, w- one thing that I, I did not highlight, in my discussion upon the 80s, which is a bit lighter in uh, as far as a chronological approach, is I think we really have to recognize that by even the late 70s and even and then into the early 80s, you know, and with John Lennon's murder within this, they have children coming of age. Um, mm-hmm. You know, not only, you know, Heather, who was six when they got married, by the mm-hmm. early 80s, Mary, Stella they're coming of age, they're becoming teenagers. And I think there's a real settled down aspect of their lives that perhaps is overlooked, right? Where they're not going to go. And obviously for a lot of reasons, but they're not necessarily going to go on world spanning tours. They may not be exploring opportunities to record in new Orleans or on a boat in the Caribbean, these type of places. But I don't think he was lost um, at all. I think, you know, perhaps, um, and we can certainly, we know that Lennon's murder affected everyone dramatically, but I think he right. was he was working as hard as he was. It just, it was going in different directions. And much as McCartney was a shift away from the Beatles, so too then the, the 80s albums are shifts away from Wings or what you may have expected um, that good point. sort of that that continuance and to be. You make a good point that a lot of people really overlook when we talk about Paul's eighties, uh, and that's his family. His you you hit it on the head. His kids yeah. were getting older, right? So you know, teenage years that's volatile time. So you one might one might argue that even if Lennon had not been killed, Paul might have scaled back anyway in the eighties because he was going to be with his family more. Interesting take. Mm. Yeah, I mean it, it's. Prior to Lennon's murder, that they they buy the the farm in Sussex, yeah. So I mean, there's definitely mm. um, maybe a revised approach to raising their family. You know, obviously away from London, away from Scotland in that right. respect as out, well. Out, yeah, far away. Right. Yeah, that's that's a good that's a, that's one aspect of it because you know, mm. oh, patchwork like Tom said, lost eighty. It's not really, but you know, and in, in when you factor it all in, Lennon, his own family, what he was doing. Yeah, it's it's not it's a very mis misguided. Yeah, movie. I mean, then you 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 got him assuming that he can you know write a script for for you know you know for a film or you know he, he's he, you know he feels maybe he feels invincible you know maybe he still has the confidence he can do that. I mean, obviously there's bits parts that that knock his ego down you know a little bit kind of you know like the like the the film did or you know you know press the the results of press the play probably weren't the results that he wanted you know, during, during the eighties. But, but like you said, Andy, he kept chugging along. He kept recording. He never stopped recording. You know, you know, I look at the, 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 the foster sessions where we got, you know, I uh, love this house, um, you know, and stuff like we that. Got he got married even goes all the way back to then. We got yeah. married. Yeah. Beautiful night. Um, you know, he kept recording. Um, but whether or not he was comfortable with, with what he was doing, uh, you know, manager guidance, uh, you know, as well. With so that, even with the, the movie, though, see, he's, not, oh, he's yeah. not he's not afraid to he's not afraid to take risks. He's you know, right. He could have just said, you know what, I'm not going to make this movie. And maybe now he regrets it. But at the time, he's like, I'm going to do this. I really don't care what anybody thinks. And that is right. admirable. Yeah. Well, he's as 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 you all said, I mean, he's he's continuing to work. He's experimenting, maybe. He's collaborating with very high-profile writers, not only on Tug of War, on Pipes of Peace. You know, it, he's really exploring some of the, the newer producers, some of the newer music, musicians, and working with them on Press to Play, on some of the work that followed that wasn't released, you know, and then on to Flowers in the Dirt, right? He's really... I, I, I always find that, that it's just so productive, and I think that's often, you know, you overlooked that, um, you know, Tom, do your question, is he lost? Is he, you know, is all this going on? It's like, I don't think so. I think it's just, it's not the same approach as it was a decade earlier, and it's not right. going to be the same approach as it is a decade later, two decades later, even mm-hmm. now. Right. 
Right. I mean, look, some of the contemporaries, too, in that mid 80s. I mean, you know, Elton, you know, I mean, Elton John was still having, you know, hit from time to time. But I mean, his albums weren't, you know, I mean, no, his big, 80s big, albums big, were big hits like no. the, like the 70s where, you know, Clapton was, was was doing popular stuff, but he wasn't, you know, as popular as probably he was in the 60s and 70s, you know, either. I mean, really, I mean, with Genesis and Phil Collins, I mean, I think they were probably the exception, uh, you know, to the rule, you know, in there mm. in that first half of, of, of the 80s. But um, but yeah, you got, got to admire him for continuing to going, even though, you know, the success wasn't there as it was you know, in the 70s. 82, 82 and, and back. See, look, look, I mean, even coming up, you know, McCartney too, I mean, that was still successful. Right. But in, in, so from 82 on, he, I mean, he's in his forties in the eighties. So that's old to teenagers in the 1980s. And that's, and we're talking 40 years ago now. <laughs> yeah. But then you, but, but then you look at something like I've got my mindset on you, right? Here's another person, you know, in his forties and doing this, you know, he looks like such an old man in this, in the rocking chair, right. Or in the chair. And then he gets up and, you know, the body doubles, you know, obviously doing well, the dancing, yeah. but, <laughs> you know, but, uh, but who's to say who, you know, why, why George was able to score number one with a, with a cover and then why, you know, Paul was unable to do or, or when, unable to get a number one with something as beautiful as um, No More Lonely Nights. Mm. Yeah, interesting stuff. But um, let, let's jump to uh, anthology. And well, before um, we do that, real quick, just the, yeah, you, you have one chapter that's just on the the, the death of Lennon. It was chapter four, I believe. Uh, in, the, in your book, yeah, it's well, it's part of the overall yeah. '80s chapter. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Right. 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 Yeah. Um, yeah, tragedy and reunion for McCartney. I still remember how it was before. Mm -hmm. So that it ties into Lennon's death and the anthology. So go ahead and take it away, Tom. Well, um, yeah, the anthology. Here we go. You know, Paul gets this these cassettes from from Yoko. There, I mean, they're just coming off of the of the um, uh, a, a law dispute, right? With Paul getting more in, in royalties, you know, resigning with um, resigning with 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 Capital. Um, it, it just doesn't seem like it's it's the best period for the three. But then, obviously, I think getting these cassettes. I mean, it, you, you know, when you go back and you see the images from from the anthology, you know, even though there was some disagreements, uh, let's say, and Paul maybe not maybe didn't want Jeff Lynne as a producer, but you know, George got has this power. Here's Paul. You know, he, you know, he, maybe his ego is maybe a little inflated or deflated, I should say. But you know. It's, it seems like it's a happier time with, with the three working together. We're here with the with the, with the music uh, with with Lennon. What's what do you think on you know the anthology and, and Paul during this time? I think Paul had a great time. I mean, I think um, you mentioned you'd watch the first um, rewatch the first couple of episodes, and I think you know one of the things that I've I've yeah. commented before is that Paul just looks like he's having fun, right? Wherever he's interviewed, he looks like he's really enjoying himself. I think he 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 must have absolutely been thrilled to be able to revisit it and recount his tale, um, start building the stories that we're increasingly more familiar with as <laughs> interviews follow and follow for another three decades. Right. And I think um, there are moments where George and Ringo look like they're you know they're having fun, but I think at the same time there are a bit more moments where they look uncomfortable. Yeah. Uh, George in particular. Mm. Yes. Um, right. And I think yeah. some of the recording session footage we get. Um, it you you do get a good mix. I think one of I don't remember what video it's from. If it's from Free as a Bird or Real Love, I think it must be Real Love, where they're going in the studio, and I think George has a six pack that he's hiding under mm. his jacket because he's yeah. because they're being filmed. And I think that's a very a very sweet moment and very much a that they're going to have a blast. But we also know just that those those sessions were fraught with disagreement, with dealing with the technical aspects of of the materials so i think it's they probably were able to rekindle some of their relationships but it also you know rehashed some of the disagreements some of the tensions that had been simmering either from the lawsuit which is only mm -hmm. resolved a few years earlier or you know decades earlier <laughs> and and let's yeah. not remember where, where paul is at this time as a, as a solo yeah. artist you which you really you go through in the in the book i mean you know, he puts his solo career on pause for the anthology, like totally shelves, does the New World Tour, 
has this four year period with with the uh, you know the Hamish band and all that stuff, and then once the anthology pod project gets the green light, he's like, "See you later, guys," <laughs> and he just dives in. And I I think those guys weren't really expecting that because they were pretty successful there with two major world tours. Obviously, the first tour, the eighty nine ninety, was the better of the tours. I think, even though my my co host did see him on the first time on the New World Tour mm-hmm. in ninety three, um, still a good tour, but everything really halted for the anthology and uh had it not i mean obviously he's got the fireman he's got strawberry ocean ships that came out at during oh, the this classical time. Or, uh, um, oratorial no uh oh, well yeah the 91, 91 yeah. Uh, i think a leaf comes out in 95 but what would have happened had the anthology not happened with paul's career obviously i don't even think we get flaming pie i think richard you could say right yeah no i mean so we know that there are some flaming pie tracks that predate even right um yeah yeah, you got, the anthology. Uh, Calico um, Skies, Great yeah. Day, and um, When Winter Comes. Yeah. And, so I think beautiful, we, and Beautiful Night. Yeah. Well, the original version, yeah. yeah. I mean, I think we have... Yeah, the original. And I think that's also, you know, linking back to what, what you guys were saying about the 80s. The 80s are so productive that you have a song like Beautiful Night that is, you know, maybe the later version is better. Maybe it's more preferred. Maybe the re-recording pulls it off in a, in a better way, but it's, you still have this, this background, this catalog of, of songs available that could be reworked, that could be incorporated into an album. As we know that the songs from September of 92 would be on Flaming Pie. Mm. Um, mm. I think it probably not an alternate history. We really want to see occurs, you know, the, the follow up um, to the, to the new world tour is, you know, another solo album that maybe, Right. Doesn't achieve the success or doesn't achieve the memorabilia, the memory that Flaming Pie was able to capture. Right. Interesting. I mean, it, it well, happened. Well, I mean, go ahead, Tom. Yeah. No, I'm saying, well, I mean, let's say anthology anthology doesn't happen. Okay. Jeff Lynn probably is not, isn't a co producer, you know, right? I mean, we probably still get um, certain songs, but maybe it doesn't have the, you know, that Beatles influence that, that we hear, that we hear on um, Flaming Pie. You know, which he likes to talk about, how much he was influenced. Uh, he loved going back and looking at all these images and hearing all the tracks again. And then, you know, and then incorporating all of those old tech technologies back into a new album. You know, and, and I just think that you can feel, you can, when you listen to Flaming Pie, I, I, you can tell that it was a Beatles influenced album yeah. to me. Anyways, I don't know if you guys I- feel that either. Oh, a hundred percent. I'm sure yeah. you do too, Richard. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. And I mean, the title track is itself testament. Yes. To yeah, that. Perfect. Um, I, I both, think. Both, yeah. I think by the time of the anthology in '95, enough time had passed since John had passed. They got through the legal lawsuit stuff, and right. it was just the perfect time to 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 dive into this nostalgia thing. Now we know that we also needed it. George needed it because financially he needed right. it because of the unfortunate circumstance with his own career. I'd like to think it still would have happened. If George hadn't been ripped off, but we don't know, but it, it happened enough time had passed and the events all kind of snowballed into that period in the mid nineties, which was um, mm. kind of like, you know, Beatlemania for us young enough. And all three of us <laughs> are the same close enough in the same age where that was as close as we could experience to what, to bring it back to what we started with in the interview, 1964. <laughs> really? Well, yeah. I think, you know, um, what you just mentioned to Andy, I mean, the, the, the anthology does kind of re-kickstart all three of their careers. Paul's is, of course, going to be the most prominent, but Ringo puts out an album in 98 that um, is is well-received. Mm-hmm. He's had a prolific recording career. The All-Star Band was already touring by that point, and they continue yep. to go strong now. Um, and George, we know, was mm-hmm. recording sporadically. Um, his cancer and then the attack in 99 yeah. do impact perhaps maybe – whatever product productivity might he might have achieved but we do get brainwashed um you know posthumously that's i think a very strong reflection of of what influence it may have had on him even if it's also recorded prior to during and then finished up after his death yeah Hmm. yeah so you that the the the, the coming out of that period you're getting you're getting you know um, the Beatles, even 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 Lennon posthumously, you you got you got the Lennon um, the Lennon anthology yep. four CD box set in ninety eight. Mm-hmm. So it was very it was a very fertile time um, for Beatles and collectively solo too. And then of course K 
capping the the, well, the beginning of the, the the millennium with the one with Beatles one starting a whole yeah. other thing. Yeah. Then with then really capping mm. it that five year period between ninety five and two thousand. I mean, just off the charts. Yeah, and I think as well it it's, and I know that there was you know we could we could talk about all the various Beatles collections, the greatest hits in the seventies that go through the eighties, right. the reissues in eighty seven, eighty eight. But then we've got the the live at the BBC album, the three anthology albums, and a pretty right. steady release schedule. BBC, of, yeah. yeah, we got just a very yeah. steady schedule of Beatles albums that follow. You know, you got the Yellow Submarine song track capped off with one. You get Let It Be Naked. Mm -hmm. They revisit all the Capitol right. albums. Yeah, a few more years later, you've got the Love soundtrack. Then you've got the yep. second uh, version of the remasters, and so I think anthology also. Um, brings that sort of release schedule back to life, where where it's they're revisiting it these different packages. Now almost over what thirty years, right? Which which ties into kind of now. Um, do you think now? I mean, Tom and I have talked about this a lot on the show and off the show. The last five years of of what has been issued by the Beatles collectively in solo, with these archive mm -hmm. editions, the Beatles collectively, the solo stuff. We have gotten so much in a five-year period that we did not get. I mean, you just you made a good point. We did have a nice trickle, as you just spelled out all those releases. But it would have been. That was nice just a trickle, like you said. I like it. Was, it, was, it, was a tri it was a trickle. Like, you know, 2001, two thousand one. That was a full-blown stream. Two thousand three, we got "Let It Be" Nate. and and now in five years, you've got "Pepper," "White Album," "Abbey Road," "Let It Be." Uh, imagine plastic all things must band. pass. All things yeah. must pass. Yeah. Wildlife, the wings. It's like all. It's non. It's been nonstop, and I. I'm just curious at your thoughts as to why now at the end of the of the where the physical product era is a very niche marketplace. Why have we been saturated with all this stuff now when we could have been in the last 20 years? Yeah, I. I don't know. I I I have a feeling it's just because 50 is a nice round number. For yeah. some of these Maybe. things, um, obviously, they're not all you know, the Beatles ones more so than the solo ones are very much definitely 50 years later, you know, revisited. Here's a deluxe edition, um, Revolver being the, mm. the oddball out on, on those. Um, but all things must pass. Imagine they were both, um, plastic on a band, these were all at the just roughly the 50 year marker. So I have to think that's got to be that's playing into it, right? Where marketing, yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> I don't know. I mean, they, well, I don't know that the yeah. estates or the careers need any cash. It doesn't seem like it. Um, although the prices they're releasing them, I don't know. What well, do I know? See, about that? And that's yeah. That's a whole. That's a show on it to itself. You know, yeah. The, yeah. the prices of the of these sets and our, and if you're getting you know the bang for your buck on all, on all of these sets or not, but. Uh, well, Richard, let's, let's uh, get into promoting the book here. Tell people where they can, you know, where they can find this book and, and how to get it and all that good stuff. Yeah, well, um, so I'm active on Twitter. I'm trying to increase my um, active status on some of the more recent social media. I'm active on Facebook. I've got a um, website linked uh, on my Twitter account, which is Twitter's or X, excuse me is um <laughs> ppbk writer so paperback is abbreviated writer is the full word and then the website is that same.com you can find links to um the book direct to the publisher um i've also promoted um some discount materials from the publisher for the book and i would um highly advise any folks interested in getting a copy to please please utilize that um <laughs> And we'll have all the all these links are below, folks, that you need here for Richard's contact, you know, email. Right. Well, that, that's yeah. all on here. Yeah, I mean, I will say, I mean, if if anything, I mean, the price is a little hefty, you know. I uh, but yeah. Again, well, I mean, it's it's part due to the times, per, perhaps, you know. Well, and it's uh, it's also an academic press. It um, is. It's and a university I, pressing. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And I I will I will freely admit I'm not making any money off of it. So I, as high as that price is, I I. I claim complete innocence. Well, that's a shame. <laughs> well, I'm I'm happy that um, it's out there. Honestly, it's it's it's, a, it's been a great uh, opportunity, a real thrill to be able to put something out there about Paul McCartney with with my name on it, if if you will. 
Well, um, look, I mean, this, it's a very thorough look at, at Paul's career, time with the Beatles. Um, did and you, did you, were current. You, go ahead. It goes, it goes up to, it, yes. he, you've got, you've got references to the lyrics book and the McCartney legacy, which are pub things that just came out in the last year. And got back, which now it's about to be yes. out of date because got back is starting up again here in just a few more months. So, um, right. Yeah. Immediately yeah. outdated. Yeah. 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 So, I mean, I definitely, you know, I, I enjoyed reading this book. I recommend you. Uh, you yeah. taking a look at this book. And we, um, you know, in in the comment section, let us know if you got it and, and your thoughts on the book. I mean, have you have you heard from other people? I mean, obviously, you know, you, 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 you were uh, interviewed by our good friend Joe Wisby, who was looking for that shout out. So there you go, Joe. Um, <laughs> oh, we had a, and we had a great conversation, too. So um, I'll, I'll right. double that shout out with for Joe. <laughs> Right, right. Yeah, you know, so I've, but, uh, have, you, have you been hearing from from people on uh, on the book? Yeah, I've since it's uh, I've I mean, obviously met you guys, so I've heard from you guys, and it's been a great thrill for me um, after listening to you for so many years to be able to 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 talk to you in person as opposed to just listening. Um, <laughs> I've heard from um, Joe. I've heard from um, I was on the My Favorite Beatles podcast. I did Eleanor Rigby oh. with Tim Tucker. Okay. Um, mm. And I've I've met a lot of other Beatles writers, some in person, some via um, X, I guess is what we should call it instead of Twitter. Um, right. And it, the reception has been has been really positive. Um, right. Others have have been complimentary, like 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 you and uh, Tom, like you Tom and Andy. Just been it's been such a um, been been a real thrill that it's being it is being well received. Um, I got the two blurbs on the back. I I. I oh, look, I mean, for... you can't go wrong with Womack, right? Uh -huh. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> and I know I know Thomas Kitts really well from Popular Culture Association yep. meetings. And so those two blurbs, um, I, I've known those since since um, May. Um, and so I, I had to be kind of, I guess, quiet about about those. But, um, yeah, it's been, it's been really nice, a lot of fun. My colleagues um, at McLennan Community College in Waco, Texas, excited about it. Family um, have you know, asking um, when it's available, getting their own copies. So it's, it's been a lot of fun. It's a, it's a, listen, any, listen, you know, it's really just nice that we're, as Tom mentioned at the start of the show, we're getting books dedicated to McCartney's solo career. And uh, again, we're in a nice, as I said earlier, fertile period of getting these books and yours is just the latest uh, and, and a must have addition to things after so many decades of, of getting a Paul McCartney <laughs> right. biography. And this much of it is about the solo career. And it's this much right. Beatles, and it's like right. yours is it's just people are getting it now, and uh thank you for writing it and spending the time mm -hmm. to research it and and put it together and, and share it with us well, thank you uh, yeah no, and I appreciate all you guys' kind words and just invite on to talk about it and I'm always happy Absolutely. to talk more, so um thank you it's been yeah it's 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 really nice, thank you. Well, we'll definitely do it again, so um that will wrap it up for episode two hundred and twenty one I'd like to thank our guest, Dr. Richard Driver, the name of the book again, if you didn't remember or get it. It was That Was Me, Paul McCartney's Career and the Legacy of the Beatles. It is available now at all those fine bookstores. And I even saw, if, it, if you don't like that price tag and you want to read an e-version of it, you can. it's cheaper. You can get a Kindle version of it for way less yep. than the uh, the hardcover yep. book price, too, I noticed. It was just significantly cheaper if you wanted to read it. And it's a good read. So, um, fellow book lovers out there, go get it. So, for yes. Richard... For Tom, I am Andy, and we'll see you next time on Two Legs. Have a great night. Take care. Bye. Thank you. <laughs>